this week on Viewpoints. Safety is the number one priority for individuals that are involved in intimate partner violence. Domestic abuse, why people hurt their partners and how it affects those around them. Then, I think of his story as one of the greatest stories of an American hero that nobody knows about. We'll hear about him and how he saved a quarter million people from attack and death. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. I was 35 when my life and addiction started to spiral out of control. My ex-husband threatened to take our children away from me. I felt hopeless. He called elite rehab placement because I couldn't make the call. I was ashamed. I was given skills to manage my sadness and my anger. And more importantly, I'm three and a half years sober. I'm so grateful for all their help. And all it took was making one phone call. Elite Rehab can help you start to break your addiction problem and get sober in as little as seven days. And we'll work with your insurance provider to help cover the costs. Plus, we have travel assistance programs to get you here by plane or train. Make this free call right now to learn more. 800-917-8672. 800-917-8672. 800-917-8672. That's 800-917-8672. Domestic violence is a problem in the U.S. The statistics on the numbers of women and men who are victimized by an intimate partner, be it a spouse or ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, are staggering. The Center for Disease Control cites that one in three females and one in four males will be the victim of some type of physical aggression by an intimate partner over their lifetime. That's Dr. Shannon Carl, associate professor in the School of Psychology at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Although we hear mostly about men being the abusers, women also commit acts of physical and psychological violence against close family members. What kind of person perpetrates these acts? What is the effect on family and friends? And what can be done to stop the violence against spouses, children, and other family members? As for the first question, Carl says there are a number of factors that contribute to someone becoming an abuser. Risk factors are previous exposure to violence in the home, such as during childhood or adolescence. Other risk factors are uh, difficulty to manage emotions, problems with anger management, specifically any type of substance use, drugs and alcohol, also are increased risk factors, in addition to environmental and psychosocial stressors. Dr. Jay Richards says that when you profile men who abuse their family members, you often see certain personality types emerge. Richards is a forensic psychologist on the faculty of Washington University and Seattle University. He's also the author of the novel Silhouette of Virtue. They're very egocentric, very self-centered. They tend to see everything in terms of how it benefits them. They want to be the most dominant person in the room so they're grandiose in that way. They always have to be the person who's in charge. They tend to have something that we call aggressive masculinity. So they're not just macho, but it's hostile and aggressive masculinity. So they see themselves as a super macho person, and they express that through hostility and aggression. And often they express that all the time in their language and they often express it in the workplace and with other men. It's hard to believe that a woman or man would take up with a partner with those kinds of traits, but often the abuser is on his or her best behavior during the courting phase. There are some telltale signs, though, that a present romantic interest might become a future domestic abuser. One of them is the demand. You know, when a demand is made that restricts the woman's ability to do what she would like to do, and she's basically being given not just a demand, but a command. And it's said and expressed in a somewhat intimidating tone or just a matter of fact tone of entitlement. Like, I am entitled to tell you that you will not go to the Super Bowl party because I don't want to have you associating with the men will be there. When that's expressed in a way that's just like, that is the fact, that's the way it's going to be. I'm entitled to say this to you as a demand. 
that's a real bad indicator that this person at some point, if they're frustrated, they're going to start enforcing that demand and that the demands are going to get more and more restrictive. After an abusive episode, if the victim threatens to leave, the aggressor in the relationship may seem to regret his or her actions, beg to come back, and promise never to do it again. Richards says it's a cycle of abuse that can keep the violence going. The man starts to realize he actually may feel lower self-esteem because of what the woman said, and also he realizes what he did was wrong and certainly illegal and has possible consequences. So he starts the makeup cycle, and you have the idea of the makeup sex, the, the dinner out, the flowers, the candy, promises of how it'll all be better in the future, and the cycle continues. So unfortunately, that's one of the things that happens is people believe that at the time when they've had this terrible onslaught, they believe, I'm getting out of this relationship, that's the end. But it's not the end. It's a cycle that continues. It's not just the direct target of the violence who's affected by it. Carl says that when children and other family members are involved in even just witnessing what's going on, they become victims too. The children are the most at risk. And one thing I think that's important for all of us to keep in mind is that witnessing violence is violence in and of itself. So children that are in a home where intimate partner violence is going on and are witnessing this violence are also victims. That's something that's very important. And these children and also family members and friends of the victim can feel fear for the spouse of the victim of the intimate partner violence and also fear for themselves. They can feel powerless in the relationship. Children that are involved in families where there's intimate partner violence can often feel Feel emotional abandonment because if there is a parent that is being a victim of abuse and there's an abuser, there's not a lot left over of nurturing and emotional caretaking of the children. So that can be a big piece. Carl says that witnessing abuse in the family can also lead to the continuation of domestic violence as the children grow up. Low self-esteem, behavioral problems, and also very importantly, problems with anger and inability to control one's anger itself. And if that starts to develop in childhood and adolescence, then we can see a pattern called a vertical family pattern where there's then the risk factors of the children that have witnessed this in the home becoming possibly perpetrators or victims themselves in adulthood. So what should you do if you find yourself in a situation where a partner is violent? Richard says that first, find a safe and secure place for yourself and your children. Then, don't be afraid to seek outside help. One of the first things that will secure your safety is it can't be a secret. You know, it's just like sexual abuse, this domestic abuse. Part of the reason why it continues is that it's a secret. Sometimes it's an open secret because people can see bruises and people can see black eyes, but it's not talked about. So one of the first things is it has to be talked about. And that often takes a therapeutic experience, a counseling experience, so a woman may have to go to a pastor, a counselor, or to a domestic abuse clinic just to get her bearings on how can she talk about this and who can she talk about it with safely. Carl says that law enforcement and the government are improving the way they handle domestic violence cases, handing down strict sentences and large fines for the perpetrators. Counseling is offered for the perpetrators and victims from many organizations, if they want to move on to a new life or rebuild their relationship. A lot of times there are diversion programs that are offered for individuals that may be first offenders. And there are also adjunctive services if there's need for family counseling that can be done in the home. And there's couples counseling services that can be offered for individual couples that have had a past history of violence that have both received individual treatment and are looking to rebuild their home in a nonviolent manner. Carl says that there is plenty of help for men, women, and children suffering from or witnessing domestic abuse and who want help or want to learn more about the issue. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence has a website at ncadv.org with educational resources and links to state and private programs for victims and their families. For victims and families that need immediate help, she encourages them to call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. The hotline operates 24-7, and all calls are anonymous and confidential. 
You can find out more about Dr. Shannon Carl and Nova Southeastern University on their website at cps.nova.edu. You can find Dr. J. Richard's new novel, Silhouette of Virtue, at stores and online. He also invites listeners to visit his website at jrichardsbooks.com. For information about all of our guests, log on to our site at viewpointsonline.net. You can find archives of past programs there and on iTunes and Stitcher. I'm Gary Price. Coming up, the story of a genocide and the American who saved thousands when Viewpoints returns. What are you going to do with your old car? You can try selling it, you could junk it, or you can donate it to Heritage for the Blind. Your car will be towed away for free and your donation is tax deductible. Just call 1-800-835-1478. Heritage for the Blind accepts cars, vans, trucks, and boats. It doesn't matter if your vehicle runs or not. It will be towed away for free and you'll be supporting those that need help. Heritage for the Blind is a nonprofit organization that helps the visually impaired live fuller lives. Call right now to donate your car, and as a special thank you, you'll receive a free three-day vacation voucher to over 50 locations. Call Heritage for the Blind right now. Call 1-800-835-1478. Donating is easy, and your vehicle is towed away for free. Plus, you'll get a free vacation voucher for donating. Call now, 1-800-835-1478. That's 1-800-835-1478. There is more to me, Queen Eliara of Elfgard, than my elven magic. Just as there's more to Geico than saving you money, Geico also gives you 24-7 access to licensed agents online, on the phone, or on the Geico app. And while I am a mighty elf queen, I am also a mighty big fan of barbecue potato chips. Minions! More smoky mesquite. Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. Allergy sufferers? The name's Nigel. I'm a well-educated owl, therefore well-versed in the difference between what's wise and unwise. Talking like a pirate on a job interview. Unwise. Using new Zizol for 24-hour relief of your allergy symptoms? Quite wise. In a clinical study, 90% of allergy sufferers who use Zizol felt powerful 24-hour relief after just one day. So for continuous allergy relief, don't be unwise. Be wise all. Take new Zizol. Users directed. The film Schindler's List won many accolades for its gritty portrayal of life in a Nazi concentration camp and for bringing to light the heroism of factory owner Oskar Schindler. Schindler is credited with saving 1,200 Jews from the death camps by employing them in his factory, which made enamelware for the German war effort. Certainly, Schindler deserves all of the praise he's gotten. But there's one American hero who performed a similar act of kindness, but has gained little, if any, recognition for it. His name is Asa Kent Jennings, and Lou Urenic thinks it's time he receives his due. Urenic is a professor of journalism at Boston University and author of the book The Great Fire, One American's Mission to Rescue Victims of the 20th Century's First Genocide. The genocide begins before World War I and continues on through the early 1920s. Urenic says there was a religious cleansing in Turkey that escalated to huge proportions. The Ottoman Empire was in decline. The Ottoman elite were anxious, they were paranoid, they were xenophobic, and they were looking for some excuse, some scapegoat for the decline of the empire, and they focused on the Christian population. Interestingly, and not many people know this, the Anatolia, what we now think of as Turkey, 20% of the population was Christian, you know, a really large proportion of the population. So the Ottoman elite focused on the Christians as a problem, as a disloyal minority, as a kind of fifth column, and that's when the killing began as early as 1912. It accelerated through the war. We think of the Armenian Genocide classically as 1915 and 1916. The Ottoman Empire was defeated along with Germany in 1918, and then for a brief time, the killing stopped. It started up again in 1919 when the nationalist Turkish movement gathered steam. That movement, which created a 
provisional government. It raised an army, all of which was in opposition initially to the Sultan and Constantinople and so forth. That's the army and the government that entered Smyrna in September of 1922. Urenik says that the city of Smyrna was a jewel in Asia Minor's crown at the time, with a diverse population and a thriving economy. It was called the Paris of the Orient, and people who visited there were astonished at the art and culture and sophistication of the city. So on September 9, 1922, the Turkish army enters the city of Smyrna, and commences to killing Christian residents, principally, at least at first, Armenian residents. There was an Armenian district in the city. So soldiers went into homes, pulled people out of their homes. Women were raped. Men, women, children were killed. Bodies were strewn about the streets. The stores were looted. The killing spread to the Greek Christian section, and the Turkish army continued its rampage of killing and looting there. On September 13, 1922, the army visited its final indignity on Smyrna by setting it on fire. In addition to the half million people who lived at Smyrna, about 300,000 farmers, essentially peasant farmers, villagers from the countryside who had fled ahead of the Turkish army, came into the city of Smyrna. So the fire caught all of these people, both the people who lived there, the Christians who lived there, as well as the refugees, the Christian refugees in the city, and drove everybody to the waterfront. And so what we had on the night of September 13 was this horrible scene in which at least a half a million people are caught between this very big and very hot fire in a narrow space on a place that was called the Kay, a kind of waterfront promenade, and the harbor. This is where Asa Jennings comes in. He had been an itinerant minister in upstate New York. He joined the YMCA, which at that time had a kind of a missionary purpose, was sent to France after the war. He helped decommission soldiers. Then he went to Czechoslovakia, again, decommissioning soldiers, part of the Y's mission. And then he was sent to Smyrna in August of 1922 into a relatively low-level job. He was going to be working with boys on sports leagues and cultivating Christian values and so forth. And so he was there when this catastrophe began. People tried to swim out to ships anchored in the harbor, many of them drowning in the process. Pack animals and people died from the intense heat and smoke, and no one was there to help them. It was Jennings who was moved to take action. He was a member of what was called the American Relief Committee. The Americans were proud to say the private people who were there, missionaries as well as businessmen, and we had a very big business presence in Smyrna, formed a relief committee. Jennings was on that committee, and one of the things that he did initially actually before the fire and through the fire and somewhat after, was he had occupied a series of mansions that had been abandoned by their owners in anticipation of the Turkish army entering the city. Smyrna had these big, beautiful mansions made of marble along its waterfront, and he turned them into first aid stations for women. What really needed to be done, however, was to get as many Christians out of Smyrna as possible. For this huge project, Jennings enlisted the help of another American. He asked the permission of the American senior naval officer at Smyrna, a man named Halsey Powell, who later becomes very important to the story, if he could have use of a Navy boat, small boat, and a sailor to go out and ask the captain of an Italian freighter, which he saw out in the harbor, to take some of the people away, some of the women that were in his safe houses, just get them out of the city and away from danger. Powell consented. Jennings went out. He parlayed with the Italian ship captain, paid him a bribe, and the ship removed 2,000 people from the city of Smyrna. Jennings went with them on their trip to Lesbos, which is a Greek island nearby. And when he got there, he saw that there were lots of empty merchant ships. These had been used as troop transports by Greece. And he thought, you know, if I can get access to these ships... And if we can find some way to allow the Turkish military to allow the Greek ships to come into the harbor, no small thing, by the way, you know, maybe we can begin to evacuate people and save lives. Jennings managed to secure 50 ships, while Powell negotiated with the Turks to evacuate the Christians and planned the logistics. Urenik says that Powell did not have permission from his Navy bosses to do all of this. Powell was putting his career in jeopardy. He had been told not to get involved. 
protect American property, you know, the tobacco warehouses and the standard oil tanks and so forth, but don't get involved in what is a domestic situation, a in-country situation. But he saw the suffering and he was moved. And so both Jennings initiating the action and then Powell working the Turks, they put together, it has to be called miraculous, looking back on it, in evacuation, they were given a seven-day deadline, one week by the Turkish military to get the Christians out of the city. Lots of people. And they did it. In seven days, they removed 250,000 people from the city of Smyrna, brought them principally to Lesbos, but also to some of the other Greek islands. And from there, they went mostly to mainland Greece and sometimes to some other places. Jennings said later that he felt the hand of God on his shoulder, and that gave him the courage and the will to evacuate all of those people from Smyrna. The evacuation from the waterfront, though, isn't the end of the story. Christians were being persecuted all over the region, and Jennings decided he needed to help them, too. By the end of his efforts, Jennings is credited with helping a million refugees escape to safety. The story of Asa Kent Jennings also tells another story, one that we can all learn from when we hear about strife and suffering. You know, one of the lessons that I derive from this story is the power of one person to make a difference in the world. Asa Jennings was an unlikely hero. He was a guy who was essentially handicapped. But he was always trying to be useful. He was raised in a tradition of religious service, and he was a little motor of a guy who wanted to make a difference, and he made an enormous difference. He saved lots of lives, and I think we can all draw inspiration from Asa Jennings. You can read the details of how one man, with the help of a U.S. Navy commander, saved a million lives in the 1920s in Lou Urenik's book, The Great Fire, available in stores and online. Urenic invites listeners to visit his website at smyrnafire.com to view historical photographs and documents of the events surrounding the evacuation. You can find out more about all of our guests on our website at viewpointsonline.net. You can find us on Twitter at Viewpoints Radio. Our show is written and produced by Evan Rook and Pat Reuter. Our production directors are Sean Waldron, Reed Pence, and Nick Hofstra. I'm Marty Peterson. Viewpoints returns in just a moment. Due to an upturn in the economy, Main Street Business Loans has pre-approved the release of millions of dollars in small business funding. Your business may already be pre-approved to receive up to $250,000. We've sent out millions of pre-approval letters. We see the economy growing, and our underwriters believe now is the time to invest in your business so you can grow faster and make more money. And we're prepared to give you up to $250,000 to do it. Your funds can be available in five days. There are no application fees, no annual fees, just quick access to up to $250,000. If your business did not receive your approval letter to get up to $250,000, call Main Street Business Loans Approval Desk now. 800-817-2699. 800-817-2699. 800-817-2699. That's 800-817-2699. Welcome to Culture Crash, where we examine American culture, what's new and old in books, film, and entertainment. Sometimes it seems as though pop music is a dirty word. If you say you like listening to Top 40 Radio, you may fear that you'll be perceived as shallow or immature, that you must like serious, melancholy music in order to be taken seriously. But why? The Beatles had 20 songs hit number one on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100, and when you factor in anthology albums and best ofs, 20 albums hit number one on the U.S. Billboard 200. The members of the Beatles all continued to have pop chart success even when they went solo. Elvis Presley regularly had success on pop charts. So did Stevie Wonder, Frank Sinatra, Aretha Franklin, and Ray Charles. Last month, the first solo album from Harry Styles of One Direction fame hit number one. More surprising, the album was received with generally positive reviews from critics, even if the compliments were a bit backhanded. NME, a British music magazine, called the effort not that bad, actually, 
as if any semblance of quality was shocking from a former boy band member. And this isn't anything new. In 2002, Justin Timberlake released Justified, his first album post in sync. Critic Ben Ratliff gave the album four stars in Rolling Stone and wrote that Timberlake vaulted over the canyon toward adulthood. Even artists who never were in boy bands get this kind of treatment if they exist in the pop music realm. After Bruno Mars electrified the world during the Super Bowl halftime show, the LA Times noted that Mars was subject to much scrutiny before the performance because of his young age and inexperience. And that's probably closest to a good explanation of why pop music can feel like a dirty word. Pop music doesn't mean bad, it means young. But young performers have always been the artists who innovate. The reason critics gush over the Beatles or the Rolling Stones but act shocked when Harry Styles or Justin Timberlake impresses them isn't because Timberlake or Styles are untalented, it's because they're from generations below them, and because those critics are scared to admit that pop music is pop music, and a boy band is a boy band, whether they sing Love Me Do or Bye Bye Bye. So feel no shame, wear no embarrassment, listen to what you like, make a playlist that jumps from Bruno Mars to The Who, from Stevie Wonder to Justin Timberlake. It's not all that different anyway. I'm Evan Rowe. This is Shaquille O'Neal. And the Shaquettes. Reminding you that anytime, anytime is a good time. Good time. For the cooling, drying, fresh scent of Gold Bond powder spray. Like after the gym. Or a crowded elevator ride. Or golf. Or working with hard day's work like sports casting you said it ladies stay cool with gold bond powder spray stay cool with gold bond (laughs) okay keep your eyes closed okay i want to show you my first ever painting Mm, all right okay open your eyes oh that's a lot of colors Mm -hmm. (laughs) and shapes so be honest what do you think well uh i like how if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold your paintbrush while you call them? Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Viewpoints is a production of Media Tracks Communications. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook to learn about upcoming shows and find a library of past programs on iTunes. Plus, you'll always find podcasts of our segments and information about our guests at viewpointsonline.net. Join us again next week for your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Viewpoints.